Whoa. <laughs> Don't touch anything. Don't touch. Okay. okay. Um, so um, some of you have, have probably already seen this presentation. Um, I gave this this presentation to uh, to our our summer uh, meeting with uh, when we hosted uh, MOCA Maine Old Cemetery Association. Um, you know, we basically wanted to um, you know to kind of give an overview of Elliot history because some some of these people may never have uh, ventured this far down in the state or, or spent that much time. Uh, uh, down here. Um, let's see if these controls work. Yeah. So the, the, the first thing I did was um, uh, kind of show everyone where we, you know, where we are, you know, because, you know, Maine is a big state. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, make sure everyone had their bearings. Um, in fact, you know, I, I told the, the tale of how uh, last summer uh, we actually she ventured all the way up to the very northern part of Maine to the end of Route 1. Um, and, uh, you know, if anyone hasn't done that yet, you know, you should do that, you know, at least once in your life. Um, it's, it's really neat up there, uh, you know, going through potato country. It's, it's like a whole different world. You're, you're in the same state, um, but it's just it's so, you know, vastly different than, um, than what we have down here. <laughs> So now that everyone knew uh, where where they were, um, um, and I, so this is the the start. So basically, I I wanted to start um, by you know by un, you know acknowledging the fact that you know we um, we came to you know to this area where Elliot is um, obviously used to be part of Kittery, um, but for you know for you know ten thousand years or so. Um, uh, there have been other uh, native, uh, you know, tribes that have, um, you know, come into the area after the, after the glaciers receded. Um, they were some, you know, some of the first humans uh, on this land. Um, by by 1600, that you know, th there's an estimate that the population, basically the Abenaki uh, population, meaning all of the all of the tribes in New England, um, uh, northern New England, were. Uh, probably a population of around 30,000. Um, in the area where Elliot is, um, was actually the eastern range of the Penacook tribe. So they were part of the, the, uh, uh, the, the Wabanaki um, uh, Confederacy, um, but specifically the, the Penacook uh, tribe, mostly on the eastern side. Um, but we were sort of on the, uh, you know, the frontier of a lot of, of you know, um, the the you know what what are considered the the, the usual homeland because you know the Penacook tribe um, were mostly around the Concord New Hampshire area They're, that's where their their you know biggest villages were but they did expand um, this far to the seacoast um, the 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 earliest uh, contact with uh, these native tribes uh, by fishermen and others around the coast. Actually, you know, contributed to um, the you know the the death, massive death by disease, diseases that um, Europeans you know carried that they'd had you know hundreds and thousands of years to uh, to develop um, uh, you know tolerance to um, most of these diseases were you know came about from when we you know we first domesticated animals. Um, because there were a lot of diseases at, at that time when we spent a lot of time in close proximity to domesticated animals, especially like farm animals, um, that you know resulted in some of the deadliest plagues that um, ended up killing off a lot of the native peoples. Um, and they estimate up to a 75% uh, death rate by the time um, you know by the time the you know the initial uh, settlements began to happen in Plymouth. And, and later on. So a lot of the areas that, you know, people first settled um, were pretty empty because there, there weren't, you know, a lot of, a lot of the natives, you know, weren't there anymore. Um, <clears throat> so as far as Elliot goes, um, I've said this before, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of a, a stickler for the historic accuracy. Um, um, really, um, 
you know, the earliest settlement on the Elliott side of the Piscataqua was uh, most likely around uh, 1633. Um, I know in, in the past we've, um, you know, we kind of stick to the 1623 date around here because that's when uh, Rye and, and Dover Point were um, said to have uh, first been settled. But on this side, it was still, still wilderness, still not any real settlement going on um, at that time. Um, John Mason and, and uh, Ferdinand Gorges um, divided um, their grants in 1629 um, on, on, the, on the western side of the Piscataqua was Mason's um, properties and, and Gorges had basically um, the, the eastern side of the Piscataqua, which included, you know, Elliot all the way up to the Kennebunk, uh, uh, the Kennebec River. Um, Nicholas Frost actually was one of the uh, one of the early uh, settlers. Um, he came um, ar around 1634. Um, his his friend uh, Wannerton, I actually have. So this is actually a map of you know the the, the areas of the earliest settlement. Um, you know these are, you know these are the roads that exist today. I, I'm so used to uh, to seeing to. Uh, seeing this that uh, I want to make sure everyone else, um, you know, understands, you know, what we're looking at here. Um, this, you know, this intersection here is actually, you know, four road and old road and river road. So this, you know, this, the Wannerton uh, grant, you know, existed basically on that curve, you know, where Dr. Gilbert lives now and um, where I used to live here on, on the corner Cram's Corner, um, the you know the initial uh, settlement from Nicholas Frost was uh, you know in this area um, where I'm pointing here, closer to the river. Um, so Nicholas Frost came in, in 1634 to to settle that. Um, I said 1633 as the as the first settlement because I think there were probably people um, that had built houses. It, you know, they, they, it actually says that Wannerton. Um, asks uh, Nicholas Frost to come be his neighbor. That kind of implies that he has some sort of uh, some sort of um, uh, house or, or shelter um, where, where he may be living on this land um, already. Um, and then uh, later in these same areas, this is the Thomas Kamick uh, grant that, that um, um, Alexander Shapley ended up buying um, from him through through a uh, an agent. Um, in 1636. So you can see all of these grants, you know, this is from, you know, Shapley's Creek now on River Road, all the way uh, to uh, to the Cram's Corner. Um, you know, th these were, you know, some of the, the earliest grants. And, and you know, for completeness, I, I listed uh, Jocelyn's grant. This is the one that became the Baylands uh, later. So no one really, um, settled that early except for Dennis Downing down here. He kind of squatted on this property and he paid for it, uh, but there weren't a lot of um, land titles and, and um, you know, a, a robust uh, uh, registry of deeds at that time. Um, so basically on, on this side of the, the Piscataqua, um, you know, one of the, you know, one of the big stories um, as, as far as uh, what has been going on is the, the the Hiltons, you know, Edward and William were the, you know, the first settlers of Dover Point in 1623. Um, you know, William actually, you know, looked across the river and saw that there was already a lot of, you know, cleared land where corn had been planted because, you know, the, the Indians had been uh, planting corn um, on that side of the, on that side of the river. So William Hilton decided, well, you know, I'll I'll, I'll plant my corn there too, but by uh, <clears throat> by 1632, Walter Neal then came over and said, "Hey, this your this isn't your property," and he destroyed all the equipment in 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 the corn that was growing there, and that became you know a big uh, big legal battle that actually you know still continued for like you know 20 or 30 years after that. There was a court case to to settle that. Um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> so later on in uh, 1652, in that basically that same area I was showing, 
um, there was um, is where you know Massachusetts, you know, representatives from Massachusetts came up, and uh, basically they wanted um, you know Maine to um, to submit to the to the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, but they made promises, uh, basically, you know, you know, uh, defense against Indian attacks. Um, but also, probably the the number one thing is um, they would guarantee um, existing land title claims. So all of these um, um, land uh, purchases and and acquiring of land that it occurred before there was actually a legal framework for all of all of the uh, all of the land titles. Um, uh, Massachusetts said that they would honor uh, those and, and they, they would become legally binding. Um, so a lot of the settlers at that time, you know, times, you know, thought it would, it made sense to, um, to go ahead and submit to, to the, to the rule of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It was signed at William Everett's Tavern. There's a, a plaque there now on River Road. Um, um, even though the plaque is sort of on the right side of the road, the tavern was probably on, you know, on the left side, actually, like behind uh, where Dr. Gilbert lives, if you all are familiar with that area. Um, uh, so um, it also, like, uh, one of the big things back then is, uh, you know, religion wasn't just, a, you know, freedom, freedom to wor worship whatever, whatever you wanted. Um, by submitted to Massachusetts, you've submitted to the, Pur to the Puritan church. Um, and so you you know you will have to establish a church with Puritan ministers. Now on this uh, document, which uh, I, this is actually the picture I took. So I went down to the Massachusetts archives and actually got to see this uh, document firsthand. And you know you expect it to be um, you know like the Declaration of Independence or you know if you've ever seen you know those documents that are like the size of this table or, or whatever but this document even though it's you know it looks big there it's you know it's only it's like a little narrow piece of paper about like this wide and you know this long it's it's very very small um and uh the whole time that i was trying to take a picture i had to you know i was in this room and they they they, they let everyone else you know, do what they wanted with these 200 year old documents in that room, but I, they didn't, you know, they didn't leave me. Uh, I don't know what they thought I was going to do with it, but um, so I took, you know, I took pictures of it and uh, thanked them. And right after I, <clears throat> right after I was there, Massachusetts locked down for COVID because um, that, that was uh, right before COVID hit. Um, <clears throat> So one of the things I had mentioned, um, I, I've given the whole presentation on Mary Bachelor here before for the society, but um, you know she, she actually um, signs her name or makes her mark, and then whoever is uh, doing this document signs her name to go along with the mark. Um, and, ob <clears throat> and obviously, I, I had said before how Matt, Mary Bachelor uh, could have been an inspiration for. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's uh, Scarlet Letter, uh, because uh, she, you know, she was uh, she was forced to marry the elderly minister uh, <coughs> bachelor um, when she was a caretaker for him. Um, people didn't think it was appropriate that you know she would be staying over at his house, even though I think she, he was like 40, 40 years older than her, or maybe fifty years older. Um, but eventually, she actually lived. Um, you know, down near Greenacre um, and, you know, carried on a <clears throat> relationship with a man that actually lived on the Greenacre property and um, ended up having a, a child out of wedlock. <clears throat> and so they, they uh, sent it, stirred to 40 lashes and the letter A, a was uh, branded most likely into her forehead. So it's not it's not as clean as uh, Hawthorne's, you know, just wear this embroidered letter. It's, you know, it, it was kind of kind of vicious with a, a branding iron. So, but <clears throat> later after all that happened to her, um, you know, she signed the, uh, she signed the submission to Massachusetts. You know, she, she was, she was her own woman and she was, you know, gonna, um, you know, in a landowner. So um, she, was just just as uh, as entitled as the men. Um, this 
is a needle map um, that uh, from 1670 that actually shows a lot of the <clears throat> settlement. Now, after all this, I'm going to start to lose my voice here. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and you can see the settlement pattern uh, shows, um, you know, most of the settlements, you know, around the creeks and and uh, in the rivers at that time. Eventually, it moves further inland. Um, and but um, you know, th this is it's it's kind of neat to have this this map to kind of uh, show where you know some of the settlement was at that time. Uh, one of the one of the things that were uh, was part of our early settlement. Um, is the uh, the Scottish Dunbar uh, prisoners? Um, we have a lot of a lot of the early settlers, um, you know, in the in the mid 1600s, uh, were actually uh, uh, veterans of the Battle of Dunbar and the 1650 English Civil War. Um, the Scottish prisoners they were taken prisoner and then they were sent over to New England to work as indentured indentured uh, servants, um, and we have quite a few of them. That ended up um, um, settling in in the northern part of Elliot. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, such as uh, Furbish, Neil, Gowan, Ferguson, Thompson, um, that whole area in in, uh, in northern uh, Elliot and in the uh, out to uh, Elliot Pond. Um, <clears throat> I mean York Pond and uh, and like the southern part of South Berwick. Um, there's a lot of uh, Scottish settlement um, that happened, a lot of Scottish families that settled out there. Um, there have been <clears throat> other talks um, in uh, the Old Berwick uh, Historical Society, uh, many people that have done a lot of research on the, the Scottish uh, Dunbar prisoners. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the things that really, um, you know, kind of, you know, um, is is so, you know something that you know a lot of the early uh, Elliot or Kittery um, settlers um, had to deal with um, was um, the 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 dangers from um, the you know French and Indian Wars that um, took place. Um, we think of the French and Indian War. We call the French and Indian War the last French and Indian War that took place just before the American Revolution. But pretty much all the way through 100 years before that, it was a series of uh, Indian wars. They weren't just Indians. It was really, it was really the French that were, you know, um, taken, you know, using um, a lot of the Abenaki uh, uh, Indians in the area to um, to help fight a proxy war for them because France was oh you know in a continuous war with um, England um, in Europe and the the proxy war was happening here in North America especially in New England New England and New York <clears throat> um, but really everything was you know mostly peaceful up until about 1675 with the uh, King Philip's War. Um, people have heard of, you know, Charles Frost and Richard Waldron, which Waldron was uh, from Dover. Um, after, really after um, the war was mostly over, um, they basically uh, tricked a, a, you know, a large number of Indians to, to do a mock battle um, in Dover. Um, and so the Indians thought it was um, just a, you know, a, a mock battle, but um, at the end, they were taken captive and some sold to slavery in the Barbados. And a lot of the, the local Indians <clears throat> uh, never forgave uh, Charles Frost or Richard Waldron uh, for that treachery. And in fact, the, uh, <clears throat> the picture here uh, shows the uh, Indians exacting revenge against Waldron in, in, his, uh, in his garrison in Dover. Um, they didn't get uh, Charles Frost um, right away, but eventually, uh, they caught up to him at the time of the King, King William's War uh, from 1688 to 1697. It was uh, one of the worst times in this area. Um, in fact, you know, if, if anyone has actually, uh, you know, researched uh, ancestors, if they have ancestors that lived in this area, Kittery, you know, Elliot, uh, York, Southburg, any of these places, 
at that time, you probably have ancestors um, that were either killed or taken captive uh, during during this time. And even myself, I I, I find it hard to believe. Um, you know the the lines that I can trace back to this time. It's amazing how many I find that are like, oh, they they died in this year from a from an Indian attack or whatever. So. It wasn't just something that was, you know, happened here and there. There was a, a lot of trouble um, at that time, and and people actually, you know, were wondering whether, you know, whether, the, you know, this this uh, settlement could survive. Um, but eventually, uh, wars ended, um, and and a, somewhat of a peace did come to the area. Um, this is these are pictures of uh, garrison houses that you, you know that we still see um, somewhat around this area. Um, the architecture, uh, the uh, the upper upper story uh, overhanging the lo lower story, it, it made it uh, a lot easier to um, to attack people that were trying to enter. Um, so it was a defensive feature of the houses. This here is like an old. This is actually an old picture of uh, the frost garrisons when the, the powder house was actually not on its foundation. Um, so um, it had been moved temporarily. I don't remember how many years, but um, um, in this picture, it, it was missing there. Um, um, so yeah, this is uh, some, some more examples of uh, some of the uh, architectural styles. Of the uh, of the 1600s that you find, obviously this is the uh, um, the uh, um, the can't remember the name of the house um, in Strawberry Bank, um, but um, you know you can kind of see from the old surveys, um, you know, to see the triangular um, gables uh, that were drawn um, for the you know for the uh, architecture. That um, you know, this—that's you know, basically the style of uh, house that existed in in New England at that time. Besides the the garrison houses, because not everyone had a garrison house. When you had a, a strongly um, um, built garrison house, it was usually designated as the place to go in the event of an emergency. Everybody ran to your designated garrison house um, in the event of an attack. Um, so even um, even here in, in uh, New England, we did have uh, slavery um, in the in the early times. There really wasn't you know a lot of uh, difference between the, the New England colonies and the Southern Virginia colonies, except as as far as um, the, the lack of uh, tobacco plantations and stuff. Um, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the wealthy um, the shipmasters and everything. Uh, usually didn't, you know, take on um, a number of enslaved people. Um, Black Will uh, was a, one of the subjects of uh, this this book by Patricia Wall. Um, you know, was one of one of those um, people, and he was eventually freed by uh, John Shapley in 1700. The funny thing about uh, uh, Black Will became uh, Will Black is, uh, you know, he was, you know ended up owning like a, like a hundred acres of land. And uh, eventually, um, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> um, uh, but, you know, he ended up having to sell off a lot of his estate um, uh, to pay back uh, debts and stuff. Um, and the black um, family, you know, actually were, you know the first settlers on uh, Bailey's Bailey Island, which was originally called Will's Island, um, and really a lot of there are still a lot of uh, blacks and plagues in Maine who can um, um, trace their ancestry to the original uh, um, Black Will, um, and so so it. Okay, the, the Puritan Meeting House. So, um, you know, I, I actually did a report. One of the first things I did when I, I joined the, um, the Historical Society was, you know, tried to um, give the, the, the history of the second meeting house um, that existed uh, by Cram's Corner. Um, so Massachusetts was, you know, they insisted that inhabitants attend um, 
the Sabbath work worship, um, they were fined if they didn't. So, you know, every, every uh, uh, town had to uh, supply a minister. Uh, the first, uh, the first Harvard educated minister for Elliot was uh, the Reverend John Rogers. Um, and he's, you know, pretty much the reason they built that second meeting house down there um, on, the, on the Cram's Corner. Um, and he, uh, he preached there for many, many years. Um, and he's buried in the, mm -hmm. in the cemetery that's, you know, down the road. Um, at the time that meeting house was the town hall too, there wasn't any, you know, there wasn't a separate town hall. It was, you know, um, you went to the parish meeting house, and you took care of your town business as well as, as your, um, your church uh, business. <clears throat> Capture of Louisburg in 1745 was, you know, one of the big um, events because uh, Sir William Pepperell um, was pretty much um, in charge of, of, of that um, operation. And um, he was influential in, in bringing a lot of uh, um, uh, sailors and, and soldiers from York County to, uh, to take part in that because uh, he, he lived in Kittery. Um, so when that, um, when that happened, um, you know, everyone was, you know, um, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pr pretty excited by, uh, by, you know, what, what these, uh, these, these uh, young uh, York, York County men could do. Um, <clears throat> so then we get to the American Revolution um, and Elliot, um, you know, May have been may have played a small part in the uh, the the raid on uh, Fort William and Mary. Um, they they raided um, Fort William and Mary and and grabbed the gunpowder, brought it up uh, up river, up to Durham. But on the way, it's um, believed that uh, they stashed some of it on Frankfort Island. That's you know right there um, off of the Dead Duck. Um, and it's considered, you know, the first overt action of the American Revolution. Um, so, you know, I I listed the um, uh, the company. So a lot in in the early part of the American Revolution, all of the counties kind of um, formed their own regiments. So, you know, you fought with your your neighbors. You know, you became uh, part of the same regiments. You know, your your neighbors uh, were you know were in the same company. So. It, it, it'd be kind of like if today, you know, you just got your neighbors together and decided to form a, you know, military company. And, um, and so, you know, you, you really knew one another um, at that time. Um, that's how the militias often operated. And I just, I did, um, you know, I did the research just to see who all the captains and, and the, off, and the uh, officers were for each company. Um, so this basically, you know, represents most of the most of the Elliot um, one. Um, obviously, once um, you know, once the the need for the militias aren't there, a lot of these people volunteered and and joined uh, some of the regular army. Um, um, okay, so th then you know, I talked about the the incorporation in eighteen ten. Um, I really summed it up. <laughs> Um, there was a lot of, you know, rancor at the time as far as um, um, between Kittery and Elliot, um, how, uh, um, you know, they have to travel to, you know, long distances to, to uh, travel to meetings. Um, there were, there were starting to be at that time, um, different, you know, factions of, of, of people that um, had religious differences. They weren't all Puritans anymore. There, you know, there were, you know, some bad <laughs> Baptists were coming, um, you know, eventually there would be Methodists. Um, but at the time, there was still just uh, one church. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of um, um, fighting going on as far as um, um, people um, not being allowed to speak at the, uh, at the town meetings, um, because they, they weren't members of the, uh, uh, the parish church. They didn't pay the parish poll tax, so they weren't allowed to speak, even though they were talking about town matters and not religious matters. Um, and in Elliott, it was mostly, we, you know, we were all, you know, the farmers out here. Um, 
and in Kittery, they were, you know, the merchants, the, the city slickers. Um, and they liked, you know, the, the city slickers, they, they didn't mind carrying a lot of debt, but the farmers, it, it bothered them to carry any debt. So that was, you know, that was a big, you know, philosophical difference. Um, and then, so I, I posed the question, why is it called Elliot? And we know that there's, there's two stories there. Um, one's named for uh, Robert Elliot, who was a, a merchant from the um, early 1700s, um, who, um, you know, was somewhat related to, to some of the uh, town's uh, people in, in Elliot at the time. The other one was that the Reverend John Elliot in Boston um, um, was a, a friend of uh, General Andrew Pepperell Fernald, um, and, and General uh, Fernald had told him um, that they were going to separate from uh, Kittery and that they needed a name. And so Reverend John Elliot suggested, well, why don't you name it Elliot? And, uh, and he said that if, he, you know, if, if, if they named the town Elliot, uh, he would provide a, a bell for the, for the belfry for the meeting house. And so, you know, we named the town Elliot, but we didn't have, there wasn't a, a, a belfry in the, uh, in the meeting house. So there was never a, a bell uh, provided. So that's the other story. I like that story better. Um, many, many years ago, I tried to uh, research that because um, the Reverend John Elliot actually uh, left a journal. Um, it's with the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, they actually uh, sent an intern to work um, to try to see if there's any mention of, of Elliot Maine um, in his journals, and there wasn't any. Um, so that was kind of disappointing, but there may still be evidence out there somewhere. So, someday we'll, we'll find it. Um, so one of the uh, the big thing is um, um, that how Elliot started to develop in the 1800s uh, was as um, shipbuilders. You know, we had this you know uh, good you know river frontage on the Piscataqua. Uh, we could launch ships out there. Uh, the Hanscom Shipyard was uh, was one of the um, the major ones. It's you know where where Green Acre is today. Um, Many uh, uh, schooner sh ships were built there, the most famous being the Nightingale. Nightingale <clears throat> being named for uh, Jenny Lind, who's an opera singer at the time. Um, and I think we all remember the story of the masthead that you know still exists today and the, the fate of the masthead. Um, but obviously um, I listed um, the, the book by uh, Richard Winslow on uh, on the, the Hanscoms. Um, brickyards, another thing that Elliot was known for starting in the 1800s. Um, the soil around the Piscataqua, Sturgeon Creek, was very uh, high in clay. In fact, I, I don't know if I know any place in Elliot that isn't clay if you dig down far enough. Um, so you know, all that clay was perfect for brick making. Um, at that time, cities, cities in New England were, were transitioning from, uh, from wooden structures to brick because uh, so many cities had been experiencing uh, catastrophic fires. Uh, so they were starting to build, a lot of the city buildings were being built with brick. Um, and Elliot was, you know, one of those, um, uh, one of those areas that provided a lot of bricks for for this, for the buildup of the urban areas in the 1800s into the into the early 20th century, our schools were you know were you know we like to um, to highlight our um, the one room schoolhouses that we have in town because you know really it's it's pretty amazing that we have so many um, that either are are being reused as as uh, single family homes, or like the number eight schoolhouse that we have, um, which is just, you know, you know, I, I don't think I've ever, you know, seen it as as nice as it is right now. Um, it's, it's such a, you know, you step in there and you're, you know, you're, you're transported into the, 
into the past. And, and Jan does a, a great job in there um, in, during certain weekends during the summer um, to keep that story going and, and, and providing you know, people that might have an interest in, in, in that um, aspect of our history. Um, so we did start like with eight or, you know, we may have had more than eight districts at one time. Um, but, you know, each district, you know, was divided up um, geographically. They built a, a one room schoolhouse. Um, eventually, the Elliott Academy was um, uh, built around 1840. That was actually just uh, up the street a little ways. Um, it only lasted, you know, 35 years before it burned down. Um, a funny story, the number five school, <clears throat> which is on um, Old Road, well, was on Old Road, um, right at the intersection of, uh, of Pine, Pine Ave. Um, the, the, um, the teacher was, was instructed not to teach Latin uh, to a group of advanced students there in 1838. <clears throat> Um, because they, you know, they didn't, you know, want, um, all of, you know, Elliot's kids to just um, move, you know, grow up, become too educated and move out, <laughs> never come back. The funny thing is about that group is it, it was an interesting, um, group of, 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 of kids at that time that included, um, um, you know, Dr. Fogg, um, who's, Father William Fogg, um, you know, Dr. Fogg gave um, the land and his house and, you know, uh, started, you know, gave the land and the money to build the, the William Fogg Library. Um, so if not for, um, you know, having a, a teacher that would um, teach him Latin and, and him being a precocious kid that wanted to learn Latin, um, you know, some of our institutions that we, um, that we have today, um, you know, are, are the result of, of that type of, um, you know, advanced learning that was, was happening. Um, really not even in just Elliot, there was a lot of, there was an explosion of, 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 um, of learning at that time in the 1800s. Um, yeah, and I, and I, told everyone that was here that the number eight schoolhouse was, we owned it and it was open um, to visitors. And also we use it as part of the second grade uh, history program. In fact, that day um, it was open, it was like 106 degrees, but, <laughs> but it, was, uh, it, was, it was open and, and anyone that could uh, visit could stop in. Um, yep, and then I, I did mention how the uh, William Fogg Library um, Daniel Fogg was, you know, the original um, landowner at that time, uh, his part of the Baylands Purchase. Um, um, and, you know, you know, his descendants, including Dr. John Fogg, were one of the, uh, um, you know, the, the Fogg family really believed in education. I mean, they not only did they, you know, help with the Elliott Academy, but, you know, the number five school, um, as well as, um, you know, the, the, you know, the William Fogg Library, um, you know, they, if, if there was a school or academy to be built, um, or a library, they, you know, they were, you know, the, um, the, the biggest proponents of that. Um, so, yeah, the, that library was, did was built in 1907. It's hard to believe because I just remember we did the, the 100 years, but now that even that's like 13, no, 14, 15 years in or something. Time flies. <clears throat> Greenacre um, was a um, originally um, an, an inn, a, you know, beautiful multi uh, multi room inn right on the Piscataqua. Um, in fact, that's the. Uh, old postcard of it um, is if you know bring your family and stay at the end at Green Acre. Um, Sarah Farmer was um, um, the daughter of uh, Moses Garish Farmer. Moses Garish Farmer obviously was the eccentric inventor um, who um, invented you know many of the, the technology at the time that would um, you know lead to the trolley cars and and uh, 
um, electric fire um, alarm apparatuses. Um, Sarah, Sarah Farmer uh, became very interested in, uh, in studying uh, the different religions of the world um, and actually started a school of comparative religion at Green Acre in 1894. Um, so every year the, there would be um, um, many uh, philosophers and thinkers from all over the world that would come and, and they would just have symposiums and, and lectures and, and, and talk about the, you know, the, the, you know, the various religions and philosophies of, of life. It sounded like it'd be a, a pretty neat uh, thing to attend. But, you know, even then, if you read, you know, uh, even newspaper articles at the time, they say how how uh, odd some of the townsfolk must have thought um, to have all these visitors um, um, that, you know, didn't look like them uh, visiting from all over the world. Um, eventually, Sarah Farmer converted to uh, the Baha'i faith in 1900, and then Green Acre became a center for Baha'i education after her death in 1916 and continues today. Governor John F. Hill, he was born in Elliott, um, and uh, obviously he has uh, his family home was on, uh, on Governor Hill Road. Um, he ended up going to attending medical school in Brunswick. Is another one of the native born sons that uh, ventured away because, you know, once, once he was off to school, I don't think he, he came back to visit, uh, but he, he uh, he, you know, eventually left medicine and became a successful publisher in Augusta, um, served in the, the main house from 1889 to 1892 in the main Senate uh, until 1897, and then became governor for four years, 1900 to 1904. So the only, the only governor from uh, born in Elliott. So. And then Dr. Uh, John Willis was the, the uh, founder of the LA Historic Society, yet another, another one of those, you know, great minds from the, from the 1800s. Um, um, you know, we, you know, we, we owe, <laughs> we owe quite a lot to, uh, to Dr. Uh, Dr. Willis um, and, and his memory. He published the nine volumes of Old Elliot that I still read. Um, constantly re, re finding, you know, something new um, from those. Uh, but he was a, he was a medical doctor. And so his, his primary uh, job uh, was to uh, take care of, uh, take care of the townspeople um, as, you know, as a rural family doctor. So the electric railway um, was, you know, started in 1902. Um, that was the, uh, the primary mode of, you know, transportation besides, you know, horse and buggy. Uh, this was in the time before cars, mostly, um, but it, obviously it was the automobile that most likely sunk the, the, uh, the, the viability of the, of the trolley system. Although I think it would be, it would be neat if the trolley still existed, even if, you know, even if it was just one line somewhere just to, to ride it for old time's sake. But at that time, and you know, before the automobile, like there were trolley tracks and lines everywhere, um, you know, that connected all of the towns um, in this area. Um, in the early uh, 20th century, the uh, the Sydney Lanier Camp um, was down on uh, River Road, um, you know, pretty much where you know Dr. Gilbert property is and across the, the road. Um, uh, so that, that camp ran from 1908 to 1940. It's actually founded by the son of, of uh, the poet, Sidney Lanier. Um, a lot of children came from urban areas in Boston and New York to, to learn uh, rural skills. Um, so this was their getaways from the, from the streets of the city to, to come up to Maine, spend the summer in Maine, and, and and learn how to make baskets and things like that. Um, so, in school consolidation happened. Um, the the end of the one room schoolhouses 
um, when you know the town started to build um, larger schoolhouses to to hold you know all of the classes. Um, Laura V. Dame schools built in 1925. Um, the high, um, high schools were built to replace Elliott Academy in 1966. Elliott combined with South Berwick to create Marshwood High School. So as part of this presentation, you know, I kind of, I tried to go from the very beginning to up to the modern times, part of what, you know, I called the 400 odd years of of Elliott history. So um, one of the more modern things that we've done in Elliott is um, creation of all these, uh, the solar panels um, to, to generate um, our own uh, um, energy um, to try to uh, take care of, you know, most of our municipal energy needs. Um, so and I, I think that is a, a, a neat, um, a, a neat thing that, um, you know, Elliot should be proud of and, you know, it'll be, you know, modern history some days. So, you know, I needed to, uh, to impress all the, uh, the uh, MOCA folks with that. Uh, the last thing I, um, I ended with, um, mainly because, you know, it was, um, it was a meeting for, for MOCA. Um, everyone there was very, you know, really interested in, in old cemeteries um, and trying to find old cemeteries. Um, and, you know, Roseanne can, can testify to how important it is lately um, that we've had online access to almost to all of the deeds in, in York County. Um, you know, we can search them. It's been a lot of fun. I've spent many, many late nights, too many, um, searching through some of these old deeds. Um, but one of the, um, you know, an example is, you know, we read through these deeds and you'll see the, where it says reserving the burying ground of 16 square rods. Um, it's a lot of times in the deeds, you'll find, um, you know, you'll find evidence that there's a burying ground, you know, in this parcel of land. Maybe we don't even know about it today, uh, or, and, but maybe we do. Um, but if we didn't know about it, then there's a possibility that, you know, either um, it had been moved or it had been forgotten about, and maybe it still exists there. So with um, being able to, um, um, to, to research and search through a lot of these, these online deeds, that has been, you know, a really helpful tool. And I, I kind of told, you know, the MOCA folks that if, 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 if they don't have that ability in their own counties, then to, to, you know, to contact their, their, uh, the registry of deeds to, um, so that they can, um, you know, get, get this kind of service because for historians, for researchers, um, it's, you know, it, it's, it's an important piece um, to have. And that was, uh, that was pretty much the end of that presentation. So I just flew through 400 years of, of Elliot um, in, in about an hour or so. so. Yeah. Any questions for her? I was thinking about when we, when we separated from Massachusetts. One of the other things that um, upset people was the disparity between who was paying taxes and what kind of taxes they were paying. Because the farmers, of course, had the land. And, and I think they, theirs were worth oh, yeah. more yeah. than the people down in Kittery Point. I mean, it's not like today where a waterfront gets you, you know, high taxes. It really was large landowners. And that that was up in the Elliott section, the east for the upper there. Right. I think that's probably another. Right. Another reason that the farmers were so upset because Kittery spent money like right. it was water. Yep. And uh, we had we had to pay the bills, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm.